I once was lost but now I'm found. In 1870, an Aramaic manuscript was discovered, entitled The Gospel of the Nazarenes, translated and published. This ancient scripture, hidden away for centuries in a Tibetan monastery, seems in every respect to be identical to the work by the same title, that was known and widely quoted from in the first century by the church, but then lost. Looking at the book, here's how the rear cover describes the book, known also as the Gospel of the Perfect Life, translated from the original Aramaic and edited by a disciple of the Master. This is one of the most ancient and complete of early Christian fragments, preserved in one of the monasteries of the Buddhist monks in Tibet, where it was hidden by some of the Essene community for safety. The contents clearly show it to be an early Essenian writing. Originally published in London, 1923. The Gospel of the Holy Twelve is widely believed to be a pseudepigraphic, publication purportedly from the early Christian era. The first collected edition of essays, or lections, by the author, a former clergyman, Reverend Gideon Jasper Richard Oosley was published in 1901. By the time of Oosley's death the title was out of print but the executor of his manuscript, Samuel Hopgood Hart reissued the text in 1924. There have been numerous editions published since the 1950s and the title remains in print and on the internet. The Gospel of the Holy Twelve presents vegetarian versions of traditional teachings and events described in the canonical New Testament. One explanatory preface referred to an ancient source manuscript preserved in the monasteries of Tibet that has never been produced or proven to exist. In subsequent editions, released during the early 1900s, the anonymous editors revised their claim by stating that the text was communicated by departed mystics in dreams and visions of the night. The work remains unrecognized by academic biblical scholars and has been dismissed by modern theologians and historians. Regardless of its believed origins or its animal rights claims, there are parts of the book that ring very true for me especially the parts about the mother and the idea that this could be the mystical cue source for the synoptic gospels. Many of the most revered early church fathers, as well as a surprising number of scholars today, have boldly declared that the legendary gospel of the Nazarenes, later to be known as the gospel of the Holy Twelve, is nothing less than the long lost original gospel. You have all heard of the Q source. This is the designation for a gospel that no longer exists, but many think must have existed at one time. Because 19th century scholars found fragments of such an early Christian composition embedded in the gospels of Matthew and Luke, this may very well be the long lost Q source now found. Legend holds, it was collectively written by the actual twelve apostles in the period immediately following Christ's death, and that all of the biblical synoptic gospels are based on this writing. For nearly two thousand years, all we objectively knew of Jesus came to us primarily through the biblical gospels. And yet, for all this time, a great and enduring enigma has loomed over these lofty works. In the 4th century, the ruling authorities of Rome decided which of the countless texts, based on Christ's teachings in circulation at that time, would make up the present-day Bible. This was now deciding once and for all. In effect, it said which works were to be judged as authoritative and which were not. This decision, unfortunately, carried the undeniable taint of political compromise, and the bishops making these decisions were doing so at the direct command of the Roman Emperor. Their future financial and social well-being was, and everyone agrees, entirely under his control. It has been whispered ever since the 4th century that much of the true message of Jesus was edited out at that time, due to the oppressive and theologically obtuse influence of Constantine. The Christian scriptures that failed to be admitted into the Bible were then outlawed, collected, and destroyed.
Prior to 325 AD, many of the early church fathers had included in their writings mention of an earlier gospel, that they claimed in near perfect unison, with the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke had all been based on this earlier writing. For nearly 2000 years, historians considered this work to have been irrevocably lost, but in 1870 a forgotten copy was discovered, hidden away in a Tibetan monastery, and was quickly translated from the original Aramaic. It was published this time as the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. This work was translated into the old style King James English by Rev. G. J. R. Oosley. The work was quickly rejected however and considered blasphemous by the Church. This sacred text, now here available for all to read, constitutes evidence that such a collective testimony not only was composed, just as reason suggests it would have been, but has successfully survived the centuries after all, even in spite of whatever political forces that might at one time have been aligned against it. It seems as if the authorized Gospels in the present day Bible are all various edited versions of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Some material originating in this text has even found its way into the biblical books of Acts and Revelations. In many ways, while reading it, the familiar age-old message of the Bible comes through as always, but then one is suddenly jolted upright, reading startling passages that directly defend the very non-Western traditions of reincarnation, the female aspect of creation, and compassion for all creatures along with the equally unfamiliar tales of Jesus studying various mysteries and wisdom traditions in India, Persia, and Egypt. In many places, then, what is written in this text contrasts sharply with the familiar story and message in the authorized Bible. It teaches strict and uncompromising vegetarianism, describing how Jesus' anger at the temple was not merely directed at the financial business going on there, but was specifically over the selling and slaughtering of sacrificial animals in the temple, which was supposed to be a house of prayer, but had been changed, he cried, into a slaughterhouse. The idea that Jesus might have felt outrage at seeing the cruel carnage of innocent creatures in the holy temple seems fully consistent with his character as we have collectively come to imagine him. This is also an interesting variation of the money changers event and comes across as a more plausible occurrence. The Gospel of the Holy Twelve claims that one of the primary reasons Jesus was so adamantly condemned by the religious authorities of Israel was because he advocated an end to blood sacrifices at the temple. To bring an end to these sacrifices, of course, would have completely undermined the financial livelihood of much of the temple priesthood, and they would have seen Jesus as embodying a personal threat of great consequence. In effect, he disrupted their financial and spiritual foundation, an act more certain to elicit intense opposition from the Judaic priesthood than could scarcely be imagined. The text also claims, not that Jesus was the only begotten son, but, phrasing it quite differently, that he was the first begotten son of God. The small change in terminology entirely undermines the traditional church's position that Jesus was a unique divine being who simply chose to become human, instead, this text now suggests, he was also, in some respects, a human who, through persistent effort and faithfulness to the law, perhaps over many lifetimes, had become a divine being, suggesting the very Gnostic notion that anyone can also attain the same accomplishment. In a more modern perspective, the text also directly advocates euthanasia, but only in cases of extreme suffering. Always and everywhere throughout the text, the image of Jesus is one utterly dedicated to gentleness and loving care for all beings. Many scenes involve Jesus rebuking someone for cruelly or inflicting pain on others' beings, whether people or animals. The Gospel of the Holy Twelve declares that in order to achieve eternal life, the law must be fully obeyed. In this respect this text shows us a very Essene Jesus indeed, with his unequivocal focus on the law that must be obeyed. But the law, to this Jesus, was not altogether the same law written in the Hebrew Old Testament, but rather a universal law pre-written into the inner being of man. 
Jesus claimed the law given by Moses, had been altered, betrayed and adulterated by the priests of Persia during the Jewish people's captivity there. The true law given by Moses was, this scripture maintains, the same ancient law that is pre-written in the hearts of all men, the law of love and the unity of all life in the one family of the all-parent. This work teaches that living in accordance with the inner law is the key to salvation, eternal life, and the kingdom of heaven. It teaches that if one experiences the death of the soul, it is not because one was condemned by God or anyone else, but by being self-condemned. Whatever the evildoers suffer after death would be that which they themselves created in their own unconscious souls prior to their deaths by betraying the law, the sense of right and wrong, that is pre-written into our inner being. The Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Philip, and Gospel of Truth found at Nag Hammadi, reconciling and integrating the dual nature of all being is a main focus of this text. God is repeatedly called not Father, but the Father Mother, or the All Parent. His attributes are repeatedly described with equal but opposite word pairings such as love and wisdom, head and heart, soul and spirit, within and without, right and left, and male and female, or the oneness of the divine bear. But by whatever name, is constantly being mentioned, advocated, and described and declares that salvation comes through the reconciliation and integration of these two primordial elements of being. This ancient manuscript claims in no uncertain terms to be the same work composed by the Twelve Apostles, and, in fact, it makes an intriguing and compelling case for being just that. Its antiquity seems beyond question, as this 19th century text contains words, phrases, and concepts identical to those found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Gnostic Gospels of Nag Hammadi, which were only unearthed in the 1940s. The text therefore cannot, as these connections prove, be anything but authentic. The big takeaway here for me is the distinctive feature that includes the belief that the Holy Spirit is Jesus' Divine Mother. Not to even bring up the vegetarian concept of the Essenes and of Jesus. That will be another day. To finish, I'll share the Mormon perspective. Mormonism has a number of scriptures that support the idea that assorted parts of the Bible were corrupted through time, and that these corruptions would be corrected by new finds and revelations in the latter days. Here's one such scripture. I, Nephi, beheld a book, and it was carried forth among them, the Gentiles in America. And he said, Behold it proceedeth out of the mouth of a Jew. And the angel of the Lord said unto me, Thou hast beheld that the book proceeded forth from the mouth of a Jew, and when it proceeded forth from the mouth of a Jew it contained the fullness of the gospel of the Lord, of whom the twelve apostles bear record. Wherefore, these things go forth from the Jews in purity unto the Gentiles, according to the truth which is in God. Mormonism holds that the version of this Bible that has been passed down to us through Roman era rabbinic and early Catholicism has many plain and precious things taken out. The Mormons hold, that parts may still exist in Tibetan libraries and other buried locations, 